Okay, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, another uh, live guest chat, cyber chat. And today we have Keith Newton, who is a game engine programmer from Epic Games. And if anybody knows anything about the game world, knows Epic Games is one of the top notch. Uh, we are very privileged to have Keith among us. Um, another additional thing besides Keith's um, experience in the game engine is he is fairly a new graduate. Um, he's been working with Epic Games for about a year, and he has worked on several um, big titles, and I'll let him talk about all of that kind of stuff. And um, so he can give a, answer a lot of questions from the just recently graduating, getting your career started, and how he did, and how he did it. And I think you're going to find this very valuable because he gives some very good pointers on that. OK, so all do, and I'd like to give the mic over to um, Keith and let him go ahead and introduce himself and uh, um, talk about it. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Keith. Thanks. Keith, you there? Uh, so like Samuel okay. said, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, so my name Great. is Keith Newton, and I am an engine programmer at Epic Games. And uh, like Samuel said, I just graduated uh, a year ago from Full Sail. And I volunteered to do this just because I felt, as a, a recent graduate myself, I would have some good information to give you guys because you know, a year ago today, I was in the same spot you guys are at. So um, ready to get the ball rolling. Oh, awesome, awesome. All right. Well, let's let's get off right started then. And uh, I'd like to say, like, since you're in the gaming field, how did you actually get started in this? Did you um, have you always wanted to be a gamer? Have you always wanted to know the nuts and the bolts behind the scene and jump right in there and do it, or um, did it kind of just metaphor into this, like you were actually doing something else and moved over there, or how did you actually get into that? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So originally, I didn't really have a goal to go into games when I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. I was originally interested in being a professional hacker. And um, in my quest to become a, f a professional hacker, I had gotten interested in programming. And I was always a very avid gamer. And just one day, I was, it was like I was playing Tribes or something, and it just occurred to me, it was like, wow, you know, how the hell do these guys do this? And that kind of started my odyssey into game development. Awesome, awesome. Um, so basically, you were kind of getting into like a computer side kind of stuff and programming, and it kind of like uh, switched into the games because you enjoyed the gaming and stuff. Is that what you're trying to yeah, say? Yeah, exactly. Yep. That and it's cool, like cool. gaming is it's a very it's a very complicated uh, problem. You know, a lot of people will be like, you know, what do you do? I'll be like, I make games. And they hear, I play games. And, you know, that's just not the case. Making games is a very complicated process. And as a programmer, you know, to me, that's very interesting. Outstanding, outstanding. So uh, when you started getting into this, um, when you finally decided to get into the actual nuts and bolts of making the games, um, what triggered you on what you had to do in order to get into that field? Um, well, you know, I didn't, I guess, really approach it like that. It was more or less like, you know, I know that these guys are out there, they're making video games, and so what do I need to do to learn how to make video games myself? There wasn't, there wasn't any clear path. It was just like, all right, I need to learn how to program. What do I need to do to learn how to program? And then once I was very comfortable with programming, it was like, you know, all right, what do I need to do now to learn, you know, graphics? And then I, you know, would go online, conduct research, and uh, and it was only until like after I graduated high school, and then it was like, oh dang, now I got to go to higher education and get a job and all that crap, where I started thinking about, you know, how do I get into the industry? Because at that point, it was I was all about just kind of doing my own thing. Oh, very interesting. Um, so, uh, did at one point did you figure out that you had to have your education in order to get this started? And when you did discovered that you needed your education, um, what prompted you and what areas to go into into that education? Um, so 
I was always very against education, <laughs> um, which I guess uh, sounds really bad. Word, man. Uh, okay, all right. But, we got to cut him yeah. off right now. We got to get out of here. Right, no, I'm just kidding. right. I mean, like when I was, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, I was just one of those kids where, like, I had a, a very negative attitude towards the institution of academia and everything. And uh, I resisted going to college. I really didn't want to. I didn't feel it was necessary. But um, what I ended up going mostly just because my dad wanted me to. <laughs> and, oh, uh, good for the dad. I got tired, <laughs> I got, I got tired right. of uh, that whip, with man. Crap that whip, right? Right, right. But I mean, it definitely paid off. You know, like looking back on it now, it was it was a good thing. I'm glad I did it, and it's definitely a beneficial thing to have when you're job searching. And because a lot of companies, you know, like they won't even look at your resume if it's you know if it's like, hey, I don't have a degree. And a big part of that is just showing that you can start something and then you can finish it. You know, a lot of companies know that what you were learning in college may or may not necessarily be directly applicable to what you're going to be doing as your job, and they're okay with that. They're, they just want to see that you, you did it, you made it through the long haul, you finished it, and then they'll teach you everything you need to know to do that job once you get hired. And so I, I don't regret it one bit. Outstanding, outstanding. So you mentioned that um, uh, getting the job, that's, that's a good Thing. How did you know about seeking a certain job? How did you know to go for this, these type of jobs? And what, what do you think that you needed in order to get that job? Did you need like a portfolio? Of course, you, you already talked about that your dad whipped your butt to get you into the educational area. So what else did you need right, besides right. education? <laughs> Um, okay, so again, like for me, like I just I loved programming, and so from the point where I was like in my early to mid teens. I just I programmed all the time, and my belief, you know, is that to get a leg up on you know the people that just go to college to get a computer science degree, I wanted to work on all these projects in my spare time so that I would be able to bring all this additional experience. And in my opinion, you know, that's that's a big part of the job searching process because. If you're just going to go to college and just do your computer science degree, you're essentially just part of the status quo. You know, that's that's kind of just like what everyone's doing. And so, if you want to set yourself apart and get a lot of experiences that you can't get as you're going through um, your regular university curriculum, you know, you gotta you gotta take some initiative and and work on these side projects. And it was actually like in terms of what companies and how to apply at these companies. Um, I learned a lot while I was working particularly on open source projects just because I would come in contact with guys who were professionals in a variety of uh, software related industries and I would just be talking to them about you know like what do they do, how did they get to where they're at, you know what advice did they have. So it was definitely a lot more learning involved in working on those projects than just the software engineering aspect of it. And I would highly recommend to anyone um, looking to go into any industry you know, to be a self-starter, be proactive, and work on these these side projects. You know, because it shows your passion, and it shows that you know, hey, I'm not just like some regular guy coming out of college. Like, I love doing this, and you know, you want to hire me because I'm just gonna you know bust my butt and do whatever it takes to get the job done. Outstanding, outstanding. So you're saying that not only is the education important, but you need to also try to build up your resources. Um, to present yourself, like a portfolio. And exactly. So, like, I mean, like education, right? So, you go to college. You know, if you're going to a traditional university, you're gonna, you're going to be there around four years. Maybe you're on the five-year plan. However, you know, you decide to do it. And but you know, the, uh, a university they can only fit so much into their curriculum. You know, you only have like a finite amount of time where you're going to be in the classroom. And you know, they have so much they have to fit into that. You know, you got your prerequisites. You know, English, writing, all of this extra stuff, along with you know your computer science theory, um, algorithms, all this other stuff. And so they just don't have enough time to teach you everything you need to know. And you need to take it upon yourself as a student, as someone who wants to better themselves and is interested in what they're doing, to go out there and, again, be proactive and learn these things on your own. Actually, yes, I agree to that 100%. Um, then uh, triggering into the portfolio area, how, how did you go about building up your portfolio? 
um, how to, uh, you know, what areas did you try to do to, you know, to get yourself to, to really look good? Um, so my primary interest was uh, graphics. I really enjoyed graphics while I was in school, and so I, my strategy for that was, all right, I love doing graphics. You know, I know that graphics is, is a very challenging subject to learn, and so I just devoted myself for like a solid seven months of just doing nothing but looking up graphics papers. I was going on like ATI's website, NVIDIA's website, looking through the DirectX SDK, all that good stuff, and just reading every paper I could get my hands on. And then I would, you know, take a look at all these different papers and be like, you know, that effect's really cool. And then I would try and implement it. And so, and also why I was doing this, because after I would implement all these effects, I was slowly like uh, building, you know, this collection of demos that I had done that I could use to send along with my resume, and that's pretty much exactly what I did. I, you know, I each tech demo I did basically kind of built upon all the things I learned from the previous one. And by the time I got to the point where I was sending out resumes, I had this um, nice little collection of things I had worked on. And when I sent those in, like in my interviews, you know, um, they would actually reference those things and be like, you know, why did you do this effect? What are some of the things you learned while researching and implementing this effect? Which was very helpful. And like there was one, uh, one point in my first technical interview that I did with Epic where they were asking me, you know, what had I learned about working with XNA? Because I was a huge proponent of XNA while I was in school. I really enjoyed using it. And I was like, hey, you know, I was working on this deferred shader renderer, and I ran into this problem where on the Xbox 360, you know, every time you swap a render target, it discards depth information. And then they started chuckling. And I was like, you know, what, what's so funny? I was like freaking out, right? And they're like, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. That's funny just because we've run into the same problem. And it was, you know, that was like this connection that I had made over the interview because of the time I had put in working on these demos, particularly with XNA allowing me to uh, run into this problem essentially on the Xbox 360. Outstanding. So, so you're saying that you don't necessarily have to have working experience in a game house to be able to get in a game house. You, you need basically two golden tickets, the education and, and the portfolio section. Is that what you're trying to say? Um, yeah, to a large degree. I mean, you know, it's when you don't have the the real world experience, you, know, you don't have you know all these jobs that you know saying, hey, I've worked at Capcom, EA, whatever. You have to find something to compensate for that. And my strategy for that was, yeah, just to to work on all these projects in my spare time to to show that, hey, you know. I know I don't have as much experience as a lot of these guys, but what I can do is I'm really good at learning and I'm really dedicated to learning. And I'm willing to come in here and understand that, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit behind the curve because I'm brand new, but I know I can come up to speed really quick and I know I'll be a tremendous asset to your team. And that was my approach to getting hired. Outstanding. So you, so you basically, you had the passion there and so you put, you put the energies and stuff there because you knew that you needed something to compensate the the lack of uh, working experience in the field. So you had the education already, and then you just knew that you needed the other building block to compensate the other side. And that's basically what you did. You just yep. went out, researched, built yourself up. Now, what did you actually build up? I know you talked about graphics and stuff. Did, did you get into, like, actually doing actual coding and stuff that you showed Epic and stuff, or how did you get into all of that stuff? Um, so when I was first starting out, like when I was first learning programming, um, all I did was write just like basic, you know, just anything I could think of. My skills were, you know, relatively low, so I would just write any stupid program just to get me more familiar with like learning C++ and whatnot. Um, Later on, as I got more comfortable with things, my, I guess, first foray into game development, I kind of merged my two passions, which was um, hacking and game development. And I did that by uh, getting into server-side emulation. For anyone who's familiar with that, it's basically the process of hacking an MMO. In my case, it was Dark Age of Camelot. <laughs> and reverse engineering it and then implementing it, a server, which would allow then you know anyone to connect to it and play it for free. And uh, so, I had that, and I had that experience because I had actually I had started the project, and it's called Dawn of Light. I'm not 
active with it anymore, but you can actually go find it online. Or actually, I can bring it up on my browser and I guess show it to you guys. Yeah, that would be great. This cool program lets me to do that. <laughs> That's great. Um, and so, um, so that was like my first strategy. And the reason to do that was at that time, I was like, you know. What's a skill that like every that transfers a lot of industries? In case for whatever reason like game development doesn't work out for me, I knew that like learning um, like network coding and everything like that is a skill that you can apply to pretty much anything. And so that was the reason why, along with the fact that I just am interested in hacking and reverse engineering, to uh, to do that. And so um, another interest I have was is scripting. And so in my free time, I would just I would write little compilers for embeddable scripting languages, um, and I've written a total of three. And when I got to the point in time where I was doing like resumes and everything, sending out demos, I actually included all of the work I had done on this open source emulator. I included the latest scripting language I had written, and then along with those two things, I then included all. Of of the tech demos I had written, which was just to, to show off all the graphics stuff because I wanted to do graphics. But I also wanted to show that I could do things other than graphics if, uh, if they needed me to, which was another incentive for including those other projects. Great. Now, this, uh, these things here that I'm showing right now, now this is what you're talking about. OK, there's your wonderful pictures there. Um, <laughs> now, this isn't a pose yeah. for a new uh, video game or anything, right? You're actually in the military. Yeah, yeah, I am. Unfortunately, the only pictures of myself I have are military ones, so that was why I could send you. Hey, that's all right, man. Most, most uh, a lot of our students, and uh, I mean, I've worked around contracting in uh, with DoD, and I think um, uh, several of the staff within uh, DeVry has, uh, you know, so no, there's no stick about it. I think it's all right. Um, all right, so this uh, this stuff here that we're showing right here on the screen. Uh, this is what you're talking about, some of the codings and stuff that you've done to build up your portfolio? Uh, yeah, that's an actual screenshot of a crash on one of my programs. Oh, um, no. OK. Well, I was only using what you sent me, OK? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's well, we all got a debug so, yeah, that, anyway, so. Right, right. So yeah, that's, that's an actual program um, that I was working on in September of 2006, I think, or seven. 2006. That was September 2006, and that was um, when I was working on a deferred shading renderer, and that was the first time I'd actually um, done anything like 3D with uh, the pro programmable pipeline. Oh, so, and actually, I sent so you. So you actually one of the jumped in. Go ahead. The 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 picture with the teapot that I sent you is the program that that source code is for. Yeah, yeah, right there. Uh, there's, uh, there's which one? This yeah, one. There's. Yeah, they're the same one, just with different models. So there's that one, and then there's like one with some red stuff on it. OK, that one's like a square. <laughs> OK, I might not have it in order. But anyway, that, that, that's fine. Um, so all of this is all part of your portfolio that you went to do. Now, what is this? Is this, is this part of like the coding with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the shading type stuff? This is not done in like um, 3D Studio or, or Maya or anything. This is actual all numbered crunched uh, programming right here, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that is a screenshot okay. of, um, that's a screenshot of the, the crashing program that you just showed. And uh, that is actually an implementation I can see of why, I can see why Mike would, oh, OK, sorry, go ahead. Um, Jason Mitchell, who he now works for Valve, but he used to work for ATI. Uh, he did uh, ATI research, actually. He did a paper on um, rendering volume lights. And that was actually my implementation on XNA, a very unoptimized, as you can see, implementation <laughs> with um, noticeable yeah. artifacts. But uh, that was my implementation of his paper right there. Well, see, uh, when I when I when I used to be an IT development uh, director, and I was looking for people who are doing you know simulation, and I needed programmers or stuff. And if I saw a fresh grad who had a portfolio like this, even though they didn't have any game experience, I mean, I could see where Mike from Epic would would really jump on this. I mean, I can see that you you really did an outstanding job. Um, I mean, what you sent me, even though it was a crash, I mean, what you sent me is this really good. And uh, I think the students should take note of this. I mean, this is, this is what, if you don't have the 
uh, the gaming background, uh, if you haven't worked for EA or whoever, you can still get your degree and do just like what you did, build up your portfolio. That's that you know, if you can show your stuff, um, is is really important. Now, what is all of this? What's this? So that is another tech demo. It's a very early one that I was working on, and that was just to learn how to do normal mapping. And that's a model that another student that I was working with in my final project made for me. And the normal map, as you can see, was something he just like threw together in like two seconds. It's, it was basically just a really bumpy mess just to show off the normal map. I got gotcha. you. And that's it. And yeah, it was the, the same the thing with, a, with a, a text on it. OK. Yep. All right, so this is actually done out of a 3D program. This is not a hardcore programming code here. This is uh, this is something that was done in what Maya? Is that Maya? Um, well, the actual or? well, the geometry, the mesh was done in Maya. The textures were done in Photoshop. But th that actual screenshot is a picture of a real-time application that I wrote, and so that's oh. all real-time. Very good. Very impressive. All right, now what is this? So that is um, my a screenshot of what's called ambient occlusion. And ambient occlusion essentially just approximates um, the average direction of incoming light. And so what my uh, little program did is it would calculate uh, ambient occlusion per vertex. And that's why the hull of the ship is very dark, because there's very low tessellation on the hull. And so you can see how, if you look at the very back of it, where it's like almost black, that's because the, those vertices there have a very uh, small angle for incident light, and that's why they're black. And the only other vertices that they're touching, since they're such large triangles, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that highlighter thing. Um, <laughs> are on the <laughs> on all the edge we did yesterday. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I forgot all of it. Um, you know, that's why it's more white because it has higher tessellation. And so the higher tessellation uh, means higher accuracy. So something that you would use this for is like, let's say, like with like Gears of War, right? So let's say I have my artist and he creates my high poly mesh. And let's say it's like, you know, like 20 million polygons. You know, it's like insanely detailed. So you would run like an ambient occlusion ray tracer as like a pre process. And it would generate like from this highly detailed mesh you know, this nice ambient occlusion map that you would then store in a texture. And then you could combine that with, you know, your nice normal map generated from the same mesh. And you slap those on a low poly mesh, and it gives it, like, this very rich detail, essentially, almost for free. And um, that's actually something that in UE 3.5, we just implemented screen space ambient occlusion, which is a much more um, you know, advanced te uh, version of that in that it's real time, and it um, encompasses an entire scene. Okay. Well, feel free to go into real detail program because most of the GSP uh, students are um, hardcore programmers. So um, now some of them are right. also into graphics and hello. Yeah. So yep. feel free to get into that. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, now, what is this? Is this basically the same thing, but just a different object? 